Well, good afternoon and welcome back. And thank you again for being uh, so prompt uh, in coming back. Um, apparently, we've been trying to round people up from downstairs to fill a couple of seats that were vacated. But there seems to be a lovely cabal and a party going down, down below. So hello, all of you downstairs. Uh, we understand you're having a great time down there. Um, you can actually relax and kind of just hang out and listen to great, great talks. But those of you up here, on the other hand, uh, you have work to do. Um, now, this afternoon we have uh, two presentations. Uh, Richard uh, Chaplin is going to be chatting first. And um, I'm afraid that I have an apology to make. There was a little snippet um, that, that Richard had provided, and somehow in the various to's and fro's, it, it, it was excised from your agenda. Um, so the only reason that firms exist is to serve clients, uh, which is followed by David Meister's insight that the essence of professionalism is to look after your clients even if that means recommending a competitor. The biggest peril in professionalism is allowing a narrow regulatory standards and ethics-based definition to supplant a client-focused definition. Now, why I'm particularly interested in having Richard here, not just that I know him and like him, um, but Richard has conducted a lot of deep research into this, and I think it's important that from time to time you can get yourself a little bit buried in, you know, is it all about ethics and morals and values? But real people have to manage real firms full of real professionals. Um, how do they go about it? Uh, what makes them successful? And what makes them fail you know, on the days when they're not attending a, an ethics lecture at Gresham? So over to Richard. Richard. Um, I'm going to start with giving you two definitions of professionalism. And I think, to be honest, all I really wanted, the message I really want to leave with you is definitions are absolutely critical. Because a lot of what we've been talking about, I believe, this morning, is the same word being used slightly differently by different people to mean broadly the same thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I might call a narrow definition and also a client-facing definition. So the first word is the word ethical, and I'll explore this in a bit later. And the word I'm looking at is more around inclusive. I'm also doing the same between opaque and transparency between expertise and collaborative. And I don't know where the arrows went, but hey, that's all good. Let's talk a little bit about inclusive institutions. There's a great book which I would thoroughly recommend everybody here. It's called Why Nations Fail. Now, if you called it Why Organizations Succeed, you would have sold a million copies. As it was, it's still a top 10 bestseller in the Washington Post. And it's written by a Harvard professor. And what he did was he went back to the Americas about 500 years ago, and he said, now what any observer looking at the Americas 500 years ago would have said was that there are the bit in the middle, which has got no need for central heating, had an established civilization, had roads, welfare state, human sacrifice, not so good, was likely to be more successful economically than the bit above, which was essentially prairies with nomads, and the bit below, which was after a bit of jungle, some pampas. Now, it didn't quite pan out that way, as many of you know. Now, what actually happened? He said there's certain characteristics that there's a lot of power sharing which takes place in the US of A, which you don't see in the bit in the middle, that there's a lot of creative tension. In other words, that people are always competing, but at the same time, they don't actually chop the tree down, they all shelter under. It's a very entrepreneurial culture, and there's a strong legal framework. And what he contrasts, he said, it was quite interesting. So what happened was that when the Spanish went in, and I'm married to a lady from South America, so I betray my interest here. But when the Spanish went in, they used the word conquistador. You don't need to be Spanish to be able to understand what that word means. And their basic rule was, right, rule one, find the king. Rule two, kidnap them. Rule three, ransom them. Rule four, put the native down the mine. Rule five, wave bye-bye to the treasure ships going back to Spain, drinking your pina colada. And rule six, hope you're on the next ship with your wealth already is established. Okay? Now that leads to the frontier in Brazil being how many politicians do I need to grease the palm in order to exploit the rainforest? Whereas America is a bit different because when the Virginia Company went in, the settlers, and they're called settlers, not conquistadors, subtle difference, keywords again, they actually spent the whole summer looking for the king. Didn't find one. Nomads don't have kings. So what happens? Two thirds of the settlers die of starvation first winter because they hadn't planted anything. Not good. They tried, the Span they tried the Spanish approach, level whatever it was. Right, shoot the settlers if you fraternize. Gender balance didn't help. 
and it didn't actually encourage new settlers. So what they ended up was then Heaven's Gate, the 50 acres of the mule, everything you read about the American frontier. Now, what's interesting to me is that, and I've talked about it to James Robinson, who's the author, is the extent to which those characteristics reflect the successful professional firm. Because they've all got the regional barons, they've all got the partners who want to do whatever they want to do. They compete like hell against each other. They actually tend not, they do salute the flag, they tend not to exploit, really want to destroy it. Few deal birth, for those of you who know the sector. They're very entrepreneurial and they have a framework, except in their world, the framework is one of ethics. And I would argue quite strongly that the primary role of ethics is to bind the partners together in a context of trust, as a result of which the professions are, let's not forget, the largest, most successful, most profitable and fastest growing sector in this country, in America and a lot of other places. And it's about the only sector in which China, we've heard a bit today, India, Australia, Germany are nowhere. Big four rule the wrist. Big, accounts, big law firms the same, big engineers. So the Anglo-Saxon, those characteristics, I think, what drive it, and that's around the word inclusiveness, which is the word that James used. Okay, so that's one thought. Let's look here now a little bit about what's coming out of the financial services industry. This is kind of what people have been seeing. It's an opaque and fearful culture. Uh, you can read the rest. It's just not been, just for the last five, six years, been not a good place. What could have happened if it had been a transparent and confident culture Greater integration, long-term returns, that would resurrect those things. But there's this, I'm involved in a group that's trying to actually bring some changes there. So that takes you back to the value of transparency. And then collaboration, which is the third one I put up, if you recall. And, and this is kind of the way I see professional firms working. I'm really talking, as Michael mentioned, around the people who are running the major professional firms. You start off in an uncertain world. You've got to be commercial. You've got to add value. You've got to be a consistent client, and the clients know that that can only happen with management intervention. Otherwise, you get spiky. Things, you've got some great things, and you've got some ones you'd rather not talk about. Which is the thing that you remember in the day when things go wrong? You got it, the one that went wrong, not the 99 that went right. The paving stone you stood on that went like that, not the 5,000 you spoke on that didn't. So you've got that situation. And what does that lead you to? Well, that leads you to instructions, which, quite frankly, takes you to the thought, the only reason that professional firms exist is to serve clients. Now, that may be what we heard earlier today, but I think it's quite strong. Top line growth is the key to prosperity. That's what Martin Sorrell has to say. And I love this one. The best way to improve collaboration is to instill into very clever lawyers that without a client, they have nothing. That came from the global CEO of a big law firm. So I'm going to take you quite quickly through a way that the management might go about addressing these really quite difficult pressures that are on them managing these organisations of multiple sizes. And I think there are some parallels with the health sector and others which employ professional people as overheads, not that you ever call a professional person an overhead, but that's the way they're seen, I think, often internally within those organisations. The first thing is, if you're trying to do any strategy in life, you've got to have some sort of insight, some sort of diagnosis, something that drives you to be different. And the one that we've found is that when selecting an advisor, most clients view the impression of being a well-managed firm as an essential precondition. Anybody working in a professional firm will notice the word partner is absent from that sentence, which is why the partners don't like it. But we've got some quite interesting evidence to suggest that there are uh, good reasons why it's true, because when we worked with Financial Times to talk to several hundred clients, top line, saying to what extent is this true, essential precondition, answer 52% or so yes. And the advisors, CEOs, thought it was a bit less than that, so they came in about 40. So there's a bit of a gap there. We also need a guiding policy. And again, I think this, the way we see it is that unless your people believe they're working for a well-managed firm, nothing changes. It's about beliefs. It comes from here. If they think that it's all something the management's come up with and no one's taking any notice of, you get nowhere. So you've just you've got to, how do you inspire that belief? OK, well, this is the sort of challenge that our members are up to. And this is some research we did with Harvard and IMD. We, looked, we talked to four or five hundred people and we said, OK, without being asked, to what extent would you speak highly about your firm's leadership, collaboration and long-term strategy? And the bit in the middle called C-suite members, they are responsible for it. So only about a third of them are even sufficiently positive about what they're doing to be positive. And when it comes to the next level down directors, then the numbers are getting really quite low. That's not a good place to be. Because you can't, in my mind, expect people to believe in what you're doing if only that percentage of people are that positive in terms of going out without being asked. It's quite a powerful test. 
So what we did is we thought, okay, let's talk a bit about circles today. Let's go round a circle. Let's try and understand the challenges facing the management, the people who are trying to organise these organisations. So what's the role of the board? Well, the role of the board is basically, as I see it, find out what the hell's going on, excuse the French, what's happening in the future. Most strategic plans seem to go about three years out and then stop. And think about what strategy and agenda might you be seen to be a well-managed firm. Well, let's see how they're doing on that one. So here's this is some... FT research, this one. We asked the clients to say, OK, this client CEOs, to what extent do you believe that the managing partners, the, the bosses, if you like, at the firms that you're instructing are doing the right thing and how, doing it, do it, and how well they're doing it? Well, the first set kind of indicates that they're not necessarily... Uh, priorities are not set in the same place. Now, what, what the situation that emerged there is, as we saw it, these are the things for which management is primarily responsible. Okay. Um, on the left, the rows, and then we would hope that the blues and the greens line up, because that means that the managing partners, the ones who are responsible, and the clients who are having it, the delivery done to them are in the same place. They're not. What they're really saying is management don't spend quite so much time on brand reputation and mystique, and do spend a bit more time on the bits you find boring, the operational stuff like measuring performance, client satisfaction, investing in tech and systems. And on top of that, move over to the right, excellence, that's about the only criteria that's worth going with these days in the current climate. To what extent do the managing partners think they're doing a good job on those things? Well, two of them, shaping internal attitudes and defining the vision, they're up in the, th you know, one third think they're brilliant. When you ask the client CEO for their main advisor, to what extent are these, is the boss doing a good job? Sorry, very, very low numbers. And in fact, our tech group love it because they come in at second and when does a CEO ever listen to a tech director? Never. So let's talk, that's the board's role. So they've got to think about researching the position and set the agenda and strategy. That's got to be distilled. You've then got to say, okay, how does the leader distill that strategy into a set of vision and values that actually resonate with the key audiences? And given that most of them are probably elected, thanks Gavin, excellent tone which came out a few days ago, um, their leadership capabilities are probably a bit limited, so they better improve on those. So, um, again, this, is a, this was, I think, the Harvard research, yeah. We looked here about, okay, how effective are these people as leaders? We did self-assessment, so we asked people to, to say, how good are you at leadership? We asked them, firstly, what are the most important things within leadership? Those are the rows, one, two, three. And not surprisingly, most people in self-assessment thought they were pretty good. They didn't disagree with the assessment that they were effective, 4%, 3%, quite small numbers. However, when it came to my boss, the numbers got a bit bigger. So, obviously, leaders haven't really got that one completely sussed yet. We also said, well, actually, clients quite like a direct relationship, CEO to CEO, because often the, man the partners can get a bit narrow in their focus, especially if they go through factories. So maybe the CEO can come along and compensate for that and give their helicopter view. So how well is that doing? Well, again, not too good, because what we're finding here is that the things that the clients want to talk about, which is all around regulatory and sector specific and how's it going, external stuff touching me, Whereas the managing partners want to come in and talk about internal stuff, about client satisfaction and uh, business development opportunities. It is, how can you spend more money with me? It doesn't really work. So you've got a gap there, which again is something that I think, you know, you've, you're going for a conversation and then you end up talking about the wrong agenda, you'll get the wrong outcome, basically. It's pretty straightforward. So that one isn't working very well. We then come into team, team leader, and this is where the, probably one of the worst gaps emerges. I call them unprofessional behaviour, if I'm allowed to use that term. And this is around the role model, because what they said is that the thing that is most important, far right, perceived importance for collaboration, the number one item out of the nine capabilities that Harvard come up with is that you are a role model as the leader of your group. And it's pretty high for leadership as well. Now, when you do the self-assessment, it's the thing that people think they are the best at. And when they assess their boss, it's the thing they are worst at. Now, the sting in the tail of this one is that actually the demographics of that sample in terms of seniority were pretty much the same across the board. It is, there's a lot of delusion going on here. People think they're brilliant at it, but the reality is that, they're that the people who work for them know better. Now, if you've got this sort of beam in your eye, a lot of the other stuff we've been talking about today might seem difficult to move because you can't see the point. So that one we think is a pretty major issue around people really not recognizing that they're not very good role models. 
Up to your people, you recall my quick notes about inclusive culture. Well, basically, the way that we find it works best is going back to some of the things I think we've been said by Roderick, you know, let's have some clarity around the strategy collectively. Where's the organisation going? Let's then try and sit down with the partners, and it's almost like Luther and the um, you know, sort of nail in the door in Wittenberg. In other words, the leader says, the three things I will do are these, one, two, three, and then opens the conversation, reciprocity, to the partners, say, guys, what are you going to do? Because the one thing that I've noticed through the years is the thing that really, really turns professionals on is when somebody else makes a commitment that they can audit. It's what I call, I went to see my clients, I'm going back next week to see how they're getting on. Wonderful. They just love it. So how do you build that same con 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 excuse me, conversation internally? Well, the answer is shared commitments, reciprocity, and then a tracking system so that nobody can take the proverbial. And the last one is where most people don't make it. Because if somebody feels they're not going to be, that we're all coming into this honestly, using a term that was used a lot today, and making these commitments, but then nobody is making sure that everybody who's made that commitment is being transparently observed, you're not going to get there. So there's a lot of work that can be done there. Um, we talked a little bit today about incentives. This one, I think, is probably the worst. 87% of firms say they need to develop a more commercial skill set. Um, if you look at this one called business and commercial issues, you've got about 30-something percent being trained in it, a little bit less being appraised in it, and even less being rewarded in it. I'm not saying here that money drives everything, but I think this is probably taking it too far on the other extreme. I think basically what the message is coming through from this is the FT survey is saying, yeah, actually, if, this, if you want some behavior change, then you do at least some alignment. That's just too far adrift. And then lastly, maybe, in terms of running around, deliver your clients, delight your clients through messaging. Pretty important there. Living the values. And that's really about being commercial. It's about saying, we don't really want you to stay in your, suite, your comfort zone of being current technical. That's not really very good value for our business. We want you to be commercial. We want you to be thinking into the future. Ideally, we want you to be going out to the client with the knowledge of the firm in your head, not three, three doors down the corridor when you go back to the office. So think about the commerciality. Takes you all the way around, except I said a set agenda, be seen as a well-managed firm. So let's talk a little bit about what that agenda might be and what those agendas, and there are two agendas, I think. There's the agenda for the leaders, which is um, four or five items. Make sure you actually get some clarity and get some alignment internally over what those goals are, collective and personal. Find daily reasons to praise people. Catch somebody doing something right occasionally. It's quite a good way to do help people really respond to that positively. Be fairly clear how the messaging hierarchy works. As someone once said, the role of internal comms is to prevent messages getting to the top. So think about it, it's true. Understand the personal values of your people and the cultural impact. And this one's rather long, but it's just so lovely. Practice open, transparent, sharing direct, challenging, regular, intensive two-way internal communication that builds trust and a sense of community. And if you can take that one, everybody will want to work for you, believe me. And what about for the people side? What are the clients actually saying? Well, align your, align your priorities. Look over the horizon. Ask them about what's going on. Once you get some knowledge, share it internally. Don't sit on it. Don't be a vacuum cleaner. Make sure that your clients know what you're up to. They don't always, believe me. And invest in the training tools, diagnostic and frameworks to get you there. And lastly, not of all, just remember that the decision taker isn't necessarily the person you think it is. Somebody else may actually be holding the purse strings. Uh, my, my sort of four or five takeaways, just come to the end here. So again, don't allow a regulatory expertise and ethics-based definition to supplant what I call an inclusive, transparent and collaborative client-facing definition. Nothing changes unless your people believe they're working for such a firm. A lot of what I've been talking about is be careful you don't create a strategic vacuum, because otherwise all that your people do are saying, right, we are doing segmentation, we are doing differentiation, and we're doing low cost all at the same time, so let's throw some jelly at the wall and hope some bit sticks. And your poor marketing and comms people are just completely, you've given them an impossible job. You can't, it's just not possible. Michael Porter said as much 30 years ago. So just try and avoid so a little bit of clarity. What's needed? What's your contribution? You're more likely to get the outcomes you want. As individuals, develop your personal leadership capabilities. Remember the critical importance of role models if you want to get an effective team. Don't destroy your culture. Because the key, point of eth so the key function of ethics in my mind is to sustain trust, facilitating growth. And if you, and I think a lot of the financial services sector have done this, if you move away from inclusiveness, and Barclays can't get back there quickly enough at the moment,
then you've run the risk of what the Spanish would call the, uh, fr the uh, frontier. How many politicians do I need to grease the palm in order to be able to exploit the rainforest? Not a good place to be. Um, and uh, client perceptions and reality are usually out of sync. We'll hear from Gavin in a minute. So that messaging is actually quite important. If you're taking your clients on this journey, tell them about it. Don't expect them to notice, because they won't. And for those that are interested, that's, what we've, that's really where the quotes and gaps have come from. Harvard, Financial Times, and something we do with all our leaders every year. And if you want to know more, you'll find stuff on the piece of paper, which is on the desk, together with that diagram, which I've gone through it in about 20 minutes. So it was a bit of a tour de force, but there were some quite good insights, hopefully.